welcome you to this, this joint Institution of Mechanical Engineers and Institution of Engineering and Technology talk. Um, in a moment, I'll just hand over to, to Daniel and Peter, who will introduce our speakers.
Now we also have a fleet extending out into continental Europe um, off the north coast of Germany and also um, in <coughs> Sweden. Um, this is kind of state of play as we are at the moment. This is growing uh, within Europe. Uh, last week we just won a tender to develop a 700 megawatt area in Holland and as the will explain um, there's a number of extension projects around the UK including Rampion essentially new wind farms will be located <coughs> close to existing wind farms where there's options to develop further projects and help us meet our offshore wind rollout targets that the UK government has set so a bit of a Bit of an overview there. Um, in, some, in terms of some of the more interesting technical details of the project, so on the right hand side of the screen, you can see a bit of a picture there showing you in grey the south coast area with the dot of Brighton in the middle uh, and the wind farm array to the south, uh, about 13.2 kilometres offshore, as you can see, six kilometres uh, wide by about 11.5 kilometres long. The offshore water depth is around 20 to 40 metres. This was deemed as a near shore project with a so called fixed bottom, as in there's a direct connection between the turbines and the seabed. Modern potential future projects will be starting to capitalise on floating wind foundation projects where they're not directly bolted into the seabed, but they're rather tethered to. Uh, itself is a 400 megawatt capacity project with 116 investors, the 112 turbines. The 112 part refers to the rotor diameter, so Vestas, whenever you see their turbines, you'll have the V, I think, one, four, no, 136 and then 145 as you step up, and those rotor diameters are increasing in the future as turbines get bigger, but this is a relatively old turbine now, only 3.45 megawatts, where the newest turbines are getting up towards 20 megawatts and beyond as individual units. Offshore, you can see um, all the small blue dots and the little lines in between. Uh, you've got the turbines connected with what are called array cables or inter-array cables. <coughs> Those are 33 kV cables that connect all of the turbines back to the offshore substation that you can see as a bit of a green dot in the middle of the picture. If you're looking out from the seafront at Brighton, you can often see this quite visibly. You may think there's a large ship sat out there, but it's actually a fixed um, jacket bottomed offshore substation, which operates at a voltage of 150 thousand kilowatts, uh, bringing the power from the wind farm back onto land and up to the national grid, uh, where it connects at uh, Bolney, which you can see at the end of the orange line that runs through the South Downs, um, through a 27 kilometer network. Um, if you ever get the chance, and after this presentation, if you want to learn more, there is a visitor centre on the seafront in Brighton to the right hand side of the I360 you can put on a virtual reality headset and pretend that you're climbing a turbine. I thoroughly recommend doing that. You also take children, grandchildren, um, partners, whoever, take them down there. You can learn a lot about climate change and the project itself and what we're doing to engage with the community. Um, quite a big part of what we do is community outreach and educational programmes school, so it's definitely worth visiting if you have the chance. Can I just ask, are all the cables AC or is there some GC out there? It's uh, purely AC. The, um, the distance offshore for Rampin doesn't justify the DC cable, but mm -hmm. newer projects such as um, Triton Knoll or our Sophia next project, there'll be an AC link for the main export cables. Um, just as I was mentioning earlier on there, you can see a bit of an evolution from the left to the right hand side of how turbines are evolving. Again, something Ren will mention when he comes to his presentation, but you can see Rampion in 2018, 55 <coughs> meter long blades, 
progressing to try to null, which is currently in operation, 80 meter blades. This is actually the sorry, the B164 machine. Um, and then on to our next project, Sophia, which we expect to be Siemens turbines. Um, they'll be going up to 180 meters long or 222 meters in diameter. So really quite a large and rapid increase in scale. This is also ha helping to make offshore wind projects the cheapest form, one of the cheapest forms of energy now compared to other sources available, particularly nuclear, fossil fuels, conventional projects. Um, Duplication. What I was going to do now was just show you quickly a video of Rampion wind farm construction. So just bear with me whilst we get the tech to work. And then sit back and enjoy for five minutes. <coughs> Rampion Offshore Wind Farm is the first wind farm off the UK south coast. Six years in the planning, construction of the wind farm started in 2015 with preparatory works along the onshore cable route and civil and enabling works at the substation site at Twynham. Seabed surveys, boulder removal, and two controlled detonations of one or two unexploded bombs meant that the site was ready for the installation phase to begin. In February 2016, the first of the monopile foundations arrived on site from Flissingen in the Netherlands and were installed by the 139-meter jackup vessel Discovery. The vessel has six extendable legs to raise itself up creating a steady platform for installation of the monopiles. The hydraulic hammer starts with soft piling before ramping up to drive the monopile at least 30 meters into the seabed enough to stay fixed in place for the lifetime of the wind farm. The transition pieces are then placed on top and bolted into position. From July, after a break to protect nesting black green, a second heavy lift jack-up vessel joined the project, the 161 meter long Pacific Orca. Together, the vessels completed the foundation installation on schedule in November 2016, ready for the turbines to arrive. Meanwhile, the jacket foundation for the offshore substation was also installed. This lattice steel foundation has four legs and is designed to hold the substation topside and cable deck. site was fabricated in Rosyth, Scotland, before making the 500 nautical mile journey south to the Rampion site, where it was installed in April 2017. The array cables that transport power from the turbines to the offshore substation were made in Hartlepool. They were laid on the seabed first before being buried under the sea floor. This cable laying work began in August 2016 and following a winter break was completed in June 2017. The installation and jointing of the 16-kilometer offshore export cables took place in 2017 and 2018. The installation of the 116 wind turbines started in March 2017 with the discovery 
ferry once again returning to the site. First, the tower is erected. Then the nacelle, housing the gearbox and generator, is lifted. And finally, the three blades are installed one by one. speeding up the pace of turbine installation. Both jack-up vessels worked in round trips, carrying the components of eight turbines each time they sailed from Esberg, Denmark, to the Rampian site. They would return empty and collect the next load. The last turbine was installed in September 2017, while commissioning works continued into 2018. substation at Twynham has been taking shape. Work has included the construction of a control room and gas insulated switch gear building, the arrival of transformers and other electrical equipment. After early preparatory works, the onshore cable installation process involved trenching, followed by duct laying and returning the subsoil to the trenches before the cables were pulled through. A sensitive section of chalk grassland at Tottington Mount required a special construction methodology. Large sections of turf were removed and stored to ensure successful reinstatement after the cable was installed. Seeds were harvested and are stored in the Royal Kew Garden Seed Bank to reinforce the reinstatement works if required. The technique called horizontal directional drilling was used at four locations along the cable route. Under the A27, under the A283 and River Ada, under the railway line and the coast road and beach at Lansing. By drilling under each of these, traffic and trains could run as normal. The beach could remain open and there was minimal environmental impact. To complete the project, final works involve reinstatement of the onshore cable route and substation surrounds. When weather conditions permit, topsoil is returned, grass and hedgerows planted and fences and access points removed. There will be an ongoing monitoring program to ensure the reinstatement of the full cable route is a success. During the wind farm's construction, the offshore site management team of Rampion were located at New Haven Port, working in temporary facilities at the port's East Quay, whilst a permanent operations and maintenance base was being built. The new energy efficient facilities were completed in April 2018 and house a team of 65 staff. The operations team manage the day-to-day -day running of the wind farm and they include newly hired apprentices, wind turbine technicians, engineers, marine workers and administrative staff. Rampion is already being recognised as a major South Coast landmark. With its visitor centre opening in May 2019 and Community Benefit Fund already supporting local projects, it's also leaving a broader legacy for the surrounding community. First power was generated at Rampion in November 2017, and by April 2018, all turbines were commissioned and able to deliver electricity to the grid. Throughout its operational lifetime, the Rampion project will reduce the emission of almost 600,000 tonnes of CO2 per annum and it will supply clean, green electricity to the equivalent of almost 350,000 homes every year. Just to pick up a bit more detail on my team, 
So uh, we've got about 60 people, of which about 42 are full-time employees based out of New Haven, a bit further along the coast, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we have, as part of the, the wider Arduino company, um, like a fleet engineering support team. So they help us with specific queries to manage particular issues with parts of the wind farm that we aren't experts in ourselves. Um, as you can see, the, the operational setup, we have an engineering manager, what we call a production manager. So essentially, the production manager's job is to keep the turbines running. He has a team of technicians which go out and do the maintenance on the turbines. And then the engineering manager's responsibility is to essentially set the strategy, um, manage the risks associated with the, the wind farm assets, and plan for the future. So it's quite a simple setup from a, an engineering delivery perspective. Um, and then importantly, obviously I have a health and safety environment advisor and a finance advisor. And you can see some of the pictures on here for some recent team building events we've had. Um, Paddle around the pier in the middle of the front, there's a few people wearing dresses, including me, actually, I think, on the front row. Um, the Bike Rides of Paris. Uh, so, yes, yeah, some good team spirit that we've got down on the project, but as yeah, I'm sure you appreciate from your experiences being in academia or industry, having a good, strong team spirit is really important for having a well functioning team. Um, <coughs> In terms of the operations, so yeah, about 50% of the team work onshore. Um, so of those 60 people, I think we've got about five, 10 people in the business center, um, 20 offshore technicians, and the rest of the staff manage either the office or the warehouse or the engineering planning. So quite a simple setup. Um, we have a control room in New Haven. So that's responsible for monitoring the turbines um, 24 hours a day and also planning and scheduling work. Um, they look at remote, remote fault diagnosis of the wind turbines, monitor the condition of the turbines using um, vibration monitors, doing oil analysis, all the usual things you'll do for a you know, mechanical, electrical, rotating piece of machinery. Um, and yeah, more important as well, the, uh, the logistics management. So on the picture you can see in front there, that's the operation maintenance base and the, and then the yellow line you can see is the pontoon walkway going down to where you get onto one of the two <coughs> boats, those crew transfer vessels that we have to take people to and from the wind farm to do maintenance. Um, and you can see one of those vessels here at the bottom left hand side is called a winged cat, so a winged catamaran. Um, they supply two CTVs to Rampion on a leased basis. Um, in some periods of the year, depending if there's extra maintenance going, we might hire in a third vessel, and each one of those boats can fit 12 technicians and uh, two crew personnel. And then you've also got kind of a large storage area on the front of the boat as well, which we lift equipment to and from the turbines. Um, in terms of maintenance, we're very much about being proactive in terms of maintenance. Um, obviously, we do react when turbines break down, but we prefer to operate on a preventative basis. So we've recently, recently moved into a condition-based maintenance approach now, where previously we were using a time-based maintenance approach, so we're purely taking the recommendations of the turbine manufacturer to decide what maintenance we do year to year, but now we've got bit more information after a few operation we can make some more strategic, more informed engineering decisions on what maintenance we do need to do and what we don't need to do. Um, and yeah, most work we do, we do during low wind periods. The reason for that being is when you've usually got high wind periods, you've got high sea state, it's actually not very easy to get on the turbine, it's actually quite unsafe. So, um, yeah, you can see a few pictures on the screen. You can see some people on the top of the wind turbine next to the radiators, the cooling bank. So those guys that are maintaining the um, anemometers on the top of the wind turbine used to measure wind speed as part of the control system. Um, foundation bolt test in the bottom right-hand corner 
this is at the what's called the monopile transition piece interface, essentially where you have the foundation bolted onto the yellow transition piece. There's some uh, set of bolts there keeping everything together. And then you can see two pictures in the bottom left um, where you have the main drivetrain for the turbine with the gearbox at the far end. And then on the left hand side, this is actually looking in, if you can imagine, from the front of the turbine nose cone into what's called the, the hub. Um, and this controls the, the pitch um, of the blades themselves and the wind turbine. Other maintenance activities. So, we do a lot of inspections of the blades on the wind turbines. Obviously, they wouldn't operate without them, so we need to make sure their integrity is sound, looking out for any damage there, um, potential lightning strikes, or where the paint might be starting to peel off these blades. But they are quite robust. They have many layers of paint built into them, so they are designed to last a number of years without maintenance, but they still do sometimes need repairs. Um, on the right hand side you can see some subsea pictures, we have to do regular um, subsea surveys to check the integrity of the array cables, make sure that they're still in place and they haven't been damaged by any um, operations in the area. And then bottom left hand corner you can see what is actually a picture of a couple of teeth on one of our gearboxes to check their integrity, make sure that the material is in good condition not likely to break anytime soon, which I'll come on to in a second. So, just check on time, yeah, okay. um, In terms of a few challenges we've got, the main thing is the operation <coughs> team we've driven on is our key performance indicators. So, in the top of the screen, you can see a profile. Um, this shows our average expected wind um, speed versus what we've actually received. So. In this year to date, it's actually been a not very windy year at all. You might have noticed over the summer it was quite hot and there wasn't very much wind, which is good for tourism and price, but isn't very good for wind generation, unfortunately. Um, but what we can control, we can't control the wind, we can control how much we are available. So a measure, you see the second line down, energetic availability. That's essentially a measure we use to say how much of the available wind we can capture. So if you imagine in one day there was 100 wind units um, on average over that day, based on our current availability, we're capturing 98.9 of those wind units. So that's, that's what we have within our control, what we focus on maintaining, because as long as the turbines are available, then they can generate power. Um, and then you can see, uh, respectively, our generation profile over this year. We had a fairly average um, end of winter start of spring, but then really from May onwards there was hardly any wind generation, but in the past two months that's really um, started to pick up, so it looks like we're getting towards catching up year to date. Um, something you can see at the bottom is what we call curtail, where factors outside of our control mean that we have to switch off the turbine, that's usually to do with maintenance on the, the national grid, which is what happens in this case here. So. A few other challenges we have in terms of delivering on key performance indicators, so safety, um, we measure both leading and lagging safety indicators, um, I'm sure many of you know what those are, but in case you don't, so something such as a lagging indicator is where you may have had an accident or there was a near hit, um, that's something that we didn't stop from happening. But in terms of leading indicators, we're constantly looking out for any hazards that might be present, um, doing safety drills, safety preparations, proactive things that we can do to stop safety incidents occurring. Um, it's very important for us that we celebrate the success of our team, so make a conscious effort to congratulate people when they've done well in terms of 
the other t uh, challenges we have is in terms of managing reoccurring turbine downtime risk. So you might think that you fit a wind turbine and it operates perfectly and we never have any problems. That's absolutely not the case. What we have quite often is a number of small faults, so a fault with the cooling system or a fault with the fire detection system. Um, and these faults can recur on every single turbine which are all made by the same manufacturer and if you add those up over the year they start to mount up into quite large numbers of losses so I appreciate you can't see the Y axis on here but this actually represents the total amount of financial loss that those faults would cause us and this is in the scale of um, hundreds of thousands just so you're, you're aware. Um, on the right hand side this is actually a measure of the number of total faults that we have so you can see follow that blue line, on an average month we have about 800 faults on all the 116 turbines. Some of those you can just click a button and fix it, some of them you actually physically have to go to the turbine and fix it. And then another challenge we have, um, you saw quite a bit of this in the video, major components, um, so particularly the blades of the turbines, gearboxes, generators, big heavy machinery, um, unfortunately those do sometimes fail as well for various reasons, um, but usually we can detect those failures before they occur and then get out and fix it to uh, prevent an unplanned breakdown. So yeah, recently we've been changing a few gearboxes on turbines, so we've had a couple of campaigns in the past year. So you can see in the middle there, um, the hook um, from a 35 tonne so the hook of the frame picking up a 35 ton gearbox ready to be lifted into the nacelle of a wind turbine and you can see on the right hand side there um, an operation in the evening where we're dropping that gearbox into the, into the nacelle to be replaced. And then a few things just in terms of considerations for the future, so um, in terms of the asset or engineering back to curve over the life of the project. I think we feels like at the moment we're coming out of the infant mortality stage of the wind farm. We had a few challenges in the early years. You kind of find out what all the gremlins are. You fix those. We're definitely in touch with going into the normal life phase now. As I said earlier, the project should run until 2042 um, based on a 25 year design life and then we would expect as we get towards the end of that period um, some wear out starting to occur. So even as we speak at the moment, we're starting to talk about decommissioning because the government requires us to have a plan in place now and to put money aside now to decommission or prepare to decommission the project when it gets towards the end of its life so that there's no environmental um, liability left out in the, uh, out the south coast. And then something else we're really focusing on at the moment is how we continually professionally develop our people. Um, we've recently just set up a scheme to help our technicians progress from, if they want to, become uh, more of a managerial or engineering onshore based route, where they'll do extra qualifications, have leadership training, um, try and get their own professional accreditation, because it's not often something that technicians usually think about, so we're trying to coach them through the um, Eng tech route into IEng and then on to CEng potentially in the, in the future, and then give them the experience where they can have the opportunity to do that. So we have, say, a huge pool of technicians, a great resource, and we want to help develop those to support projects like Rampkin too in the future. So I think that's all from me. A couple of photos, and, uh, some uh, recent lightning.